Hello, and today we've got a 2006 Chevy Silverado 2500 with the 4L80 transmission, and it is setting a P0894, which is a transmission component slipping, more specifically, the torque converter clutch slipping. Of course, we'd want to verify this with the test drive, and you can see with the Snap-on Movie on this top graph here, I've got throttle position shown. Uh, the second one down is vehicle speed. Third one down is torque converter clutch slip, and the bottom graph is torque converter clutch duty cycle. And you can see I was leaning into the throttle a little bit. It's at about 50% throttle position. The vehicle speed was climbing a little bit slowly. It's about 60 miles an hour. And more importantly, you could see the torque converter clutch is being commanded on. You can see this is almost at 78% duty cycle. Yet my torque converter clutch slip is still hanging at about 540 RPM. So still getting quite a bit of slip. So there's a few tests that we can do on this. One of the things that we can go through and check, this is going to be the easiest, is we're going to go ahead and check current flow through the torque converter clutch PW on solenoid. This transmission only has one solenoid that controls the converter clutch. So it's pretty easy to go through our fuse block right here. And we can go through and check uh, ignition zero fuse. The, pull the ignition O fuse out, ignition zero, and we run a jumper wire around that. And uh, we can command with the scan tool the solenoid on and off. And when we command it on and off, we can see how much the amperage changes through that solenoid. It should change about an amp because this is a fairly low resistance solenoid. And as you can see, this one here, it does switch uh, pretty close to an amp. So it's electrically seems to be working fine. This test is very good because what it can do is not only can it check to see if the solenoid is passing the proper amount of current. It also checks the wiring, it checks the driver, it checks the ability to control that with the scan tool. So all these things are pretty comprehensive and you don't have to dig around underneath the vehicle or anything like that to get to it. You can do it right there at the fuse block. Um, I used an amp clamp, but you don't have to. You could just use the, um, go in line with your amp meter leads uh, with your multimeter and do the exact same thing. Also, you couldn't hear it, but the solenoid was clicking a little bit. You'd have to get real close to it. It's a faint click. So that kind of shows you that there is a physical movement going on in the solenoid. I didn't do it on this vehicle. Once this passed that test, I pretty much went through, because this thing's only got about 70,000 miles on it. Uh, I pretty much assumed that this is going to be a bad torque converter that we have in there. So, but if you wanted to take a little bit step further, you could put a line pressure gauge on there, or you could put a cooler a gauge on the cooler line. And when you energize the solenoid on and off, you could see if you get a blip in line pressure. That indicates that a valve's moving and pressure's changing. It's, you're not necessarily looking for a certain spec in pressure, but you are looking for a change in pressure. And that would be an indication that not only is the solenoid doing its job, but it's also moving the valve that it's in charge, with, uh, in charge of. So the next thing we're going to do is we pull this transmission out and I'm going to take the torque converter and I'm going to cut it open so we could take a look to see how it failed. Not something you would normally want to do because there are core charges involved with these, but I've got extra converters and I can always send one of those back. But I want to see what's going on in this torque converter. So here I got the torque converter from that vehicle all cut open. Like I said before, I don't recommend that you cut open a converter that you're intending on sending back as a core. This one actually had a $250 core charge. So that means that the, it was only $150. So the core charge was $100 more than the cost of this converter. That basically tells us one thing, that these are in high demand. So don't assume that your converter is uh, just cheap and you can cut it open. You want to make sure that you have something to send back to them. And like I said before, I've got plenty of these converters so I can send them back. But anyway, the if you never had a torque converter apart before and understand how it operates, I do have a video on that. So you might want to watch it. This is really going to mainly cover the failure that occurred in this one. But typically what happens is this is all welded together. So this assembly that you see here spins as a unit. It's uh, driven by the engine. And when you pull it apart, one of the first things that you'll notice so on the inside of this, is on the transmission side, is the impeller. These are the fins or the blades that move the fluid uh, driven by the engine. So the fluid's going to move from the center and it's going to move outward. And it's going to fling that fluid towards the turbine. This is the turbine and the turbine is connected to the transmission's input shaft. So it's, 
The fluid coming from my impeller is going to get thrown to the turbine and it absorbs that force and delivers that to the transmission's input shaft. The stator assembly right here is going to basically allow for a recycling of fluid so that any of the energy that's left over when that turbine absorbs that force, it's going to bounce off the stator blades and ricochet back into the same direction that the engine's rotating and that kind of helps the engine spin. Like I said, this theory is all covered in a separate video. Uh, feel free to watch that. One of the things that they have on these is a torque converter clutch assembly. And here's the piston. And if you look, the splines right here spline into the back of the turbine. So when they apply this converter piston, it's going to push, that piston is going to push up against the cover and it's going to lock the turbine, which is the transmission's input, to the cover. And if we lock the cover to that piston and that piston to the turbine, now my engine can directly drive the transmission's input shaft. That's the purpose of a lockup converter. And the way it can do that is by directing the fluid flow. When they want this converter released, stop that. When they want this converter released, fluid's going to come through the input shaft. And it's going to enter this whole converter assembly between the um, piston and the cover. So here's our cover. And, you know, normally this would all be sitting in here like that. So the input shaft, the, the, through the input shaft, the fluid is delivered. It finds its way between the cover and the piston, and that pushes this piston release. Not only does it feed the converter with fluid, but also pushes this torque converter piston away so it cannot apply. And then in order to apply, as you might be able to imagine, they reverse that. So now the fluid coming through the tip of the input shaft, that's an exit route. And fluid now comes between the stator support and the input shaft, and it enters the converter on this side, the turbine side of the piston. And what that'll do by having this, the input shaft being the exit route and the, the turbine side being the feed, it's going to cause this piston to drift over and come into contact with the, um, the converter cover. Now, on a normal converter, the friction material, when it comes into contact with the cover, it's going to kind of create a seal. And we're going to then be able to build up converter pressure on the turbine side of that piston. And we're going to, boom, we're going to apply that converter to this cover with full lockup. Well, the issue that we have with this torque converter, as you might have been able to see, we are missing about two-thirds of the uh, converter clutch lining. Matter of fact, here it is right here. You can see it broke off and it's in pieces. So now, when this converter, when, the, when this torque converter piston tries to come into contact with the cover, there's a big gaping leak that's going to occur wherever this friction material doesn't exist anymore. So instead of having the fluid pressure build up on the turbine side of this piston, it's going to leak around and it's going to get basically on the release side of the piston. And if I have a balance of pressure on both sides, this thing's not going to want to apply with any force. And that is what happened with this unit here. Um, I wasn't actually expecting when I took it apart the friction material to be broken. I was expecting a crack in the piston because these uh, 4L80s uh, have an issue apparently with cracking the piston. So I was going to inspect these little curves for cracks and the hub areas to see if there's any splits or cracks. This vehicle only had 70,000 miles on it, so I was um, you know, looking for any kind of cracks maybe around the rivet pins. But when I took it apart and I saw the friction material in there, then I knew I figured out what the issue was. So then the next phase of this is get a new torque converter, a remanufactured torque converter, hopefully with some upgraded components in here. And um, also to make sure we flush the oil cooler out really well. The transmission, when the fluid flows through this thing, we've got uh, transmission fluid is going to find its way through the input shaft or in release mode, push the piston back, and it's going to find its way out of the converter between the stator and the input shaft. And because it's heated fluid at that point, this is where a lot of heat in the transmission uh, comes from, they direct that fluid right out to the radiator to get cooled off. And then they go to an air to oil cooler and then they return into the lube circuits, the lubrication circuits. So any of this material that came apart likely got pushed in back into the transmission and then into the radiator. It might not have found its way out of the radiator,
uh, into the uh, auxiliary or the air to oil cooler. But if it did, it could be in there. Um, when I pulled the pan off, it didn't have much debris at all in the pan. So most of this broken up converter material is likely in the radiator. Um, and we need to flush that. You reverse flush that. So the fluid that normally goes in one way, you're going to flush it going the opposite direction. And this is when a high quality flushing tool is beneficial. A uh, tool like hot, uh, hot flush, which I don't have, but um, like a hot flush machine is not only going to put heated fluid through it, it's going to pulse the fluid and it's going to periodically reverse it, go back and forth with it, and that breaks some of this loose. And they also give you a nice filter so that way you can take it apart and see what it pulled out and you can keep flushing it so you don't get anything out of it. And you can look at pressure and you can look at flow um, and, and make sure it's good. So if you're ever at that point where you're going to go through and uh, you found debris, metal, uh, friction material, anything like that, you definitely need to make sure you flush your radiator really well or just buy a new radiator. Whatever you do, don't just put it in and hope for the best. Don't just use compressed air. That's not going to do anything. And I don't even recommend using the cans, the cooler flush cans, because I don't think that those would be adequate. I ran ours on a cooler flusher for probably about an hour and a half to two hours. And I have it filtered just through some paint strainers to kind of catch debris. And it took a couple hours, it took an hour and a half before it started coming out where I wasn't getting any kind of pieces left. So, and uh, like I said, that's not even a hot flush machine. So I do highly recommend using a high quality flusher, especially when a converter came apart. Because you don't want to spend all this time pulling a transmission, replacing a converter, maybe rebuild the transmission and go back together and then have it fail because of a, um, of a restricted cooler. And, and even that debris, even if it doesn't overheat, that debris is going to get in potentially into the lube circuits, hang up valves, screw up solenoids. So it's, you probably got my point. Make sure that that cooler is clean, especially when you've got converter failure.